Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul G. Gill, Jr. I'm here today at the at the uh, invitation of the uh, memorial to talk about my father's memoir, uh, Armageddon in the Arctic Ocean, up the hoss pipe from galley boy to third mate on a legendary liberty ship in the biggest convoy battle of World War II. When I was about nine years old, my father loaded uh, the family in, the, in our station wagon and drove us to Kings Point Maritime Academy outside of New York City. He he had mentioned in the past that during World War II, he had served on a Liberty ship named the SS Nathaniel Green. He said there was something at the museum that he wanted to see, some sort of a plaque or memorial. We were kind of mystified, but uh, we arrived at the uh, academy and found the museum that uh, held uh, World War II uh, memorabilia of various kinds. We were ushered into a room and taken uh, to a wall where we saw the, the plaque that you see before you. It, I'll read it. It says, Unit Citation for SS Nathaniel Green. During a long voyage to North, to North Russia, SS Nathaniel Green was under incessant and violent attack by enemy planes and submarines. In most gallant fashion, and in spite of many crew casualties, she consistently outmaneuvered and outfought the enemy, finally discharging her vital cargo at this the designated port. After effecting temporary repairs to her battered hull and rigging, she took part in the North African campaign. Bound for her last port with limited cargo, she was torpedoed and in a sinking condition was successfully beached. The stark courage of her heroic crew in battle against overwhelming odds caused her name to be perpetuated as a gallant ship. Now, I want to explain that in this room where we, we saw this plaque, there were eight other plaques. And uh, I don't recall what my dad had to say about it at the time, but I've since learned that uh, the Nathaniel Green was one of the nine uh, merchant ships recognized as being a gallant ship of World War II. Now, there were over 4,200 American merchant ships uh, uh, that served during the war. So that'll give you uh, an idea of the, the distinction that uh, was conferred on her, on the ship and her crew, uh, with this honor. As, as time went on, my dad, at first he was very reluctant to say anything uh, about his wartime experience, but as I grew a little bit older and reached my early teens, he started to open up with me about some of his experiences. And he told me that uh, he had kept a, a log during the voyage to Russia, which I will show you, a day by day, almost hour by hour log uh, or diary, and he said that would be the basis for a book that he intended to write someday. My father dedicated the book to, I'll read this, to my mother, Sarah Welsh Gill, and my father, Captain William F. Gill, my anchors and the stars I steer by. So people have asked me, uh, your dad survived so many severe challenges. What was it about his background, his upbringing that, that gave him the strength? And I would say it started with my grandfather, Captain William F. Gill, who was a seafaring man, he actually went to sea fishing on the Grand Banks and the Georges Banks as a 13-year-old boy after his father died. He became the, the oldest son in the family and the main support of his large uh, Irish Catholic family in South Boston. He was uh, a disciplinarian. He was tough. He was very smart and very loyal and loving to his children. A lot of tough love, I think you could say. My grandmother, Sarah Welsh Gill, was a native of Chester, England, and she brought her own fine qualities to the family, primary, primarily, which was her, her love for the arts, music, painting, um, and her, her emotional warmth and, and love that she was so willing to, to provide her children. I think my, my dad and his brothers and sister grew up in, a, in tough times, but they felt that uh, the family life was uh, uh, the source of all their strength. So dad and his twin brother, Phil, were born on July 3rd, 1920. This picture was taken probably in the early days of the Depression before my grandfather's uh, business was uh, devastated. Uh, Grandpa had uh, retired from the sea when he met uh, my grandmother. And uh, this is a, a painting he did many years later a couple of uh, dory fishermen on the Grand Banks. 
Uh, you notice the white around their faces. That's a frozen uh, seawater. That's not, those aren't beards. Those are very, very tough conditions. My grandfather sailed in more than 50 different vessels, primarily schooners. One of the last vessels he served on as a young young man, second mate, was uh, the Ruth B. Merrill, a six-masted coal schooner that made regular trips from uh, Bath, Maine, down to uh, the coal ports in the Chesapeake, Baltimore, and so on. When Grandpa married, he opened up a rigging business in Boston. He was an expert wire rigger, especially, but Grandpa's business uh, floundered as a result of the uh, Great Depression, and the Gill Boys, of which there were uh, uh, five, uh, six actually, um, three older brothers uh, all had to leave home one by one to help support the family, and then when Dad and Phil reached 15, they also had to leave home. Dad joined the Civilian Conservation Corps and was assigned to Camp Mansfield in northern Vermont. He was there for 15 months. He loved the experience. He learned how to build roads, how to drive bulldozers, uh, top trees, uh, blow up stumps. I think that was his favorite activity, stump jumping, they called it. Taught him how to use dynamite and, and so on. He also uh, learned to box. He said he was a pretty good street fighter growing up in a very tough section of Boston, but he didn't know how to box when he arrived at Kent Mansfield, but he, he soon learned and he said he could take on any, but there are two older men who are several years older than himself and bigger. Otherwise, he was uh, uh, quite an accomplished uh, uh, pugilist. After 15 months in the CCC, Dad uh, figured he'd gotten all he could out of the out of the uh, the camp. He returned to Boston with the idea that with the skills he had learned uh, with supposedly an improving economy, he would be able to find a job, but he was uh, unsuccessful at this. So he turned to the long family tradition of seafaring. He went to a local uh, shipping office and was assigned a position as a galley boy on this ship, the SS Halo, an oil tanker that made regular runs between Braintree, Massachusetts, and uh, Gulf Ports, Port Aransas, Texas, New Orleans, uh, and Galveston. After four voyages on the Halo, Dad uh, returned home to uh, Boston to uh, find a letter from his older brother, Bill. Bill was uh, about four or five years older than Dad and was a very experienced seaman at this point and was active in, in, uh, in union activities. And Bill, in his letter, Bill warned Dad that uh, trouble was brewing on the labor front and that there was going to be a shipping strike involving the entire East Coast. There would be no work for the duration of the strike and that things could get very uh, violent. He uh, advised Dad to come to New York City to live with him and his uh, wife uh, on the Upper East Side and that uh, Bill would take him under his wing and protect him. As a result of the union activities, the National Maritime Union was created. This is uh, Dad's book, number 189. Now, you need to understand that within a year, there were 50,000 members of this new union Dad received book number 189 because he was one of the original uh, a activists who helped to form the union, uh, standing on the picket line, uh, getting fighting off uh, scabs and union thugs. And um, through Bill's uh, influence, Dad got this uh, very early number, which stood him in good stead in later years in the Merchant Marine. Book number 189 told people that uh, this is one of our, one of our uh, pioneers. To make ends meet during the, the strike, Dad and Bill uh, worked as steeplejacks, uh, waterproofing New York City uh, skyscrapers in various locations around the city. Um, you might wonder, why would a 16-year-old, or where would he find the courage to, to go up on scaffolding 30 or 35 stories above the, uh, the pavement? And uh, Dad said that as young men, he and his brothers were routinely uh, assigned by their father to climb the rigging of uh, some of the yachts that he, he uh, maintained. Uh, where the masts were 100 to 200 feet high. So he said height was not a problem with them, and they made good money doing it. So after the conclusion of the strike, Dad shipped out as an ordinary seaman on the SS Manhattan. Now, some of you may have heard of the Manhattan. She was a very famous ship at that time, famous uh, for one reason, because she was the uh, largest and fastest American passenger liner. There are many steamship lines. They made regular uh, runs uh, to European ports. Uh, the Manhattan was the most glamorous of these ships. Uh, this was the ship that the U.S. Olympic team uh, 
boarded to uh, make their way to Europe for the 1936 Olympics. And the year after dad served on the Manhattan, the Manhattan took the uh, Kennedy family to England to be, to take their place uh, in the court of St. James. Dad made two voyages on the Manhattan uh, and then uh, six more voyages on the Roosevelt. Now these ships would make regular stops in La Havre, France, uh, Bremerhaven, Germany, and then Hamburg, Germany. After the eight voyages to Europe, Dad was a little tired of the the uh, weather in the North Atlantic in the wintertime, so he signed off the President Roosevelt, spent a few weeks ashore, and then uh, signed on to the Gulf Wave, an oil tanker that made regular trips to uh, Gulf ports. He did this for a while and got bored with it. I think he made eight voyages on the Gulf Wave. Um, by this time, he had realized that he was probably never going to be able to go back to school and that his best... Uh, bet in life was to aim for a career in the merchant marine. And of course, he didn't want to be a, a, a deckhand for the rest of his life. He he aspired to become a sea captain, as was his father. So he realized to do that, he needed to accrue a certain amount of sea time. I, I don't recall exactly how many years were needed to advance to each level, but he wanted to advance from ordinary seamen to able seamen. And then uh, hopefully I uh, learned enough navigation celestial navigation, rules of the road, ship handling, and so on, to sit for uh, a mate's third mate's license. So he, he put up with the, the tedium of multiple trips back and forth to Gulf, uh, Gulf ports. But then in 1938, uh, the U.S. went into a, a second economic depression. They called it the Second Great Depression, and shipping slowed down. Only the most uh, experienced uh, sailors kept their jobs. Everyone else was on the beach, as they say. Uh, Dad spent uh, several weeks in New York City tending bar, uh, occasionally working in uh, uh, shipyards in the city, but there's no steady work, and uh, he and his older brother Steve were very frustrated. So they got wind of a project in the Matanuska Valley in, in Alaska, whereby the government was sponsoring uh, uh, families uh, that want uh, farm families from the upper Midwest to come to Alaska. The government uh, would support them for a period of time, help them to build roads and in infrastructure, infrastructure to establish themselves in new, uh, supposedly more fertile soil in Alaska. And the word on the street was that there are a lot of jobs available from anything from common laborers to people with uh, road building skills, carpentry skills. Uh, so. Dad and Steve thought, here's a great adventure. We don't have the money to buy a train ticket, but we certainly uh, can can hop a freight or two or three or as many as it takes to get to, to Seattle or Portland and from there um, uh, board a ship and and uh, reach the Matanuska Valley. Now, this was a rather pie-in-the-sky sort of uh, uh, prospect, but was, they were so desperate, they decided to go for it. So in August of uh, 1938, Dad was 18, Steve was uh, 22. They uh, hitchhiked from New York City to the Port Jervis Rail Yard, where they boarded uh, an Erie Rail Yard freight, and they went off from there to Chicago. When they got off the train in Chicago, they were walking through the yard. They decided to take a day or two and sort of recharge their batteries in Chicago. They were confronted by a, uh, a railroad bull. A, a bull is a, a cop, a private uh, policeman hired by the railroad. You have to understand that during the Great Depression, there were hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of mostly young men and women uh, riding the rails, that is, traveling as hobos on the railroads. And the owners of the railroads uh, felt that this was a big liability. Uh, there was a certain amount of uh, damage that was done by, by these hobos. There were accidents. Uh, they just didn't want them. They wanted to buy tickets as passengers. So they hired railroad bulls to to patrol the trains and the, the rail yards. And they, they did indeed do that, uh, armed with uh, shotguns. I, this trio doesn't look like uh, they'd be too uh, receptive to the needs of any young men looking for work. In Port Jervis, they befriended uh, an American Indian uh, fellow named Chief. He was a... Um, a Sioux Indian who had been hoboing for a couple of years. He was probably five or six years older than Paul and Steve and seemed to be very experienced and willing to take them under his wing. And he taught them how to ride the deck. 
That is, you ride along on the very top of the train if there's no space inside a boxcar. Uh, or to ride the blinds, that is, you literally stand on the ends of the two trains like that and ride along. Very dangerous and difficult mode of travel, especially when there's a railroad bull above you hammering at your, your hands, trying to dislodge you from the train. Dad and Steve spent many nights in hobo jungles, which uh, were encampments on generally nearby railroad yards where men would gather and sort of pool their resources. The, there would always be a big kettle boiling with mulligan stew, which was a stew made up of whatever ingredients could be found. In Chicago, our dad and Steve had planned to catch a, a Northern Pacific train through the Northern mountain states, but accidentally they got into a train headed for New Orleans. They got off in Cairo, Illinois, the very southern tip of uh, Illinois, backtracked a little bit, moved through, uh, traveled through Kansas City and Colorado and into the Dust Bowl. In Colorado, they, they spent a few days in La Junta, Colorado, which I believe is in the southern, perhaps southwestern part of Colorado, a few miles south of Denver, and, uh, and witnessed the ravages of the Dust Bowl. They were shocked. Dad talked a lot about in later years about how devastated the, the area was. Farms like this that were completely inundated with sand. Families had, uh, out of desperation, loaded up the, their truck or their, their car with all their earthly possessions and headed to California or Oregon to find work. Uh, in Denver, um, they started to hear that the Matanuska Valley w truly was a pipe dream, that there really wasn't any work available. Steve, at this point, became completely disillusioned and said he was returning to New York City and that uh, he felt for sure that shipping had picked up by this point. Dad, on the other hand, said he wanted to see the West. He'd seen some cowboy movies growing up. He wanted to see the Wild West. He wanted to see the mountains, and he felt there was a better chance of finding a ship uh, in Portland, Seattle, or San Francisco than there was in New York. So they split. Dad went, continued on westward, riding the rails. Steve went home or went back to New York. Uh, Dad was lucky in that uh, at various points he found people who were able to point him towards uh, temporary work. One of the jobs he became involved in was gandy dancing. That is, the gandy dancers were members of a crew who uh, shifted the rails. Uh, with time, rails would tend to shift uh, out of position, and a crew was required with uh, heavy pry bars to shift the crew, uh, the rails back into position. Other times they had to pick up old deteriorated rails and ties and replace them. So Dad did that for a while. Finally, he arrived in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. He was greatly disappointed to find there was no work there. Uh, things were really desperate. Uh, he realized he had no, no choice but to head down to San Francisco. When he arrived in San Francisco, it was the same story, no jobs. He, he spent a couple of weeks uh, foraging for food, uh, really desperate at this point. Uh, the missions were all full. There's no, no, no free food given out to you. He literally was, uh, it was hand to mouth. Uh, I hate to even think about how, how desperate things were, but he said, finally, one day at the Union Hall, he was, he landed a, a berth as an ordinary seaman on the SS William Luckenbach, a large uh, freighter that made regular trips from East Coast ports to West Coast uh, ports uh, by way of the Panama Canal. Dad very, was very fortunate and very happy to, to land a berth on the ship. He told me, though, when he boarded the ship, he literally had, he was wearing, he was in rags, and he had cardboard shoes, and the crew took pity on him and each contributed an article or two of clothing, and after a few weeks of uh, good uh, shipboard food, he was able to restore uh, some of the weight he had lost and to uh, regain his strength. So for the next uh, few years, Dad, uh, continuing to accrue sea time towards his goal of becoming a licensed merchant marine officer, sailed on various ships. Here he is as uh, an 18-year-old ordinary seaman on the William Luckenbach. He was probably one of the youngest able seamen around at that time. This was He was not quite 19 years old when he uh, earned his uh, able seaman license. After the William Luckenbach, he, I think he made about eight trips back and forth from East Coast to West Coast ports, he signed on to the Army Transport Republic, uh, which made regular trips between Brooklyn, New York, and uh, San Francisco, and then on to uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, bringing Army personnel and supplies. Dad made quite a few trips on the Republic, loved Hawaii, loved San Francisco, but after a while, that also became tedious. After about nine months of that, he needed a change. So he signed on the Uruguay, formerly the SS California, and made... Uh, 
four round trips uh, between New York and uh, Rio de Janeiro, Montevideo, Uruguay, Buenos Aires, and one or two other uh, ports. In 1941, the government changed their licensing policy and decided to open up uh, maritime training schools. They realized that the U.S. was inevitably going to be going to become involved in in the war and needed uh, more merchant ships and more qualified uh, merchant marine officers. So they opened a training academy at Fort Trumbull in New London, Connecticut, uh, and offered a six-month course that would lead to um, the ability of a seaman to to uh, sit for his third mate license. So dad signed up for that, started off in July of 1942. On the weekends, he was able to travel home to Boston to uh, visit his parents. And on one of his first visits home, his twin brother, Phil, uh, fixed him up with a blind date with this young lady, Mary Evans, a native of Monaghan, Ireland. I think for both my parents, it was love at first sight. They, they were engaged within a few weeks and uh, decided that they would hold off on actually getting married until after, after the war. Dad earned his third mate's license and was assigned to the, or was landed a berth as third mate on the Nathaniel Green, which was a Liberty ship then under construction in North Carolina. It was the third Liberty ship built. There she is going down the ways in, uh, I believe it was Wilmington, North Carolina. While waiting for the green to be uh, completed, Dad worked in a shipyard on the SS uh, Massachusetts, a battleship, then under construction. And he realized that he, as a shipyard worker, he was draft exempt. He could have continued on in that safe job, making good money, um, could could have gotten married, uh, be near, near his, his home in Boston. Uh, but he he didn't want to do that. He, he said, I was a professional mariner. I was not a shipyard worker. I was a professional mariner. He graduated from Fort Trumbull on December 10th. So at this point, the U.S. was in the war, and Dad felt uh, he had no choice but to uh, but to serve uh, in the war zone. This is a telegram Dad sent to my mother. I'll read it. On SS Nathaniel Green, United States Line, Pier 60, North River, New York, leaving immediately, I shall be back in three months, bound for North Sea. Ocean, oceans of love to you, always on my mind, till we meet again. Here's a, one of the very few extant photos of the Nathaniel Green. The Green traveled to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and then joined a, a convoy, had an uneventful trip across the Atlantic to uh, Loch Long outside of Glasgow. This is Gorak, a little town on Loch Long, showing some of the mostly merchant ships uh, gathered there, probably assembling for a convoy at some point during the war. Convoy PQ-18 was the 18th and last of the PQ convoys. Uh, PQ, by the way, simply represents, is taken from the initials of the man who devised this Russian convoy system. In the summer months, the convoy traveled around the, the west of Iceland, skirted the uh, ice banks as far north of uh, northern Norway as possible and down into either Murmansk or Archangel. Uh, and the reason they, they did this because the the Nazis held Norway. They had air bases uh, in various points in Norway. And uh, to travel along the coast in the most direct route would have, would have been suicidal. As it was, they were subject to U-boat attack uh, throughout the journey from beginning to end, uh, right up to the White Sea. But at least uh, by taking this uh, rather indirect route, they were not exposed to air, air attack until they reached the area around Svalbard, what was once called uh, Spitsbergen when they came within range of uh, Luftwaffe bases in northern Norway. So the convoy consisted of uh, 40 merchant ships originally and 40 to 50 escort vessels of various types. This is a schematic of the formation. Clustered in the center are the, the merchant vessels, and then in a ring all around are various uh, destroyers, any aircraft cruisers, uh, corvettes, minesweepers, and also a few uh, submarines. This is a schematic of the merchant ships themselves. Nathaniel Green originally was the fourth column over from starboard, two rows back. She eventually switched positions with the John Penn because the John Penn was having difficulty maintaining her position. At the request of uh, Captain Vickers of the Green, she switched positions. Sadly, the, the John Penn, uh, a few days after they switched positions, was struck by an aerial torpedo and, and sank. First few days of the voyage were marked by terrible weather. The, the convoy was constantly in danger of being broken up, uh, but they were able to maintain contact with each other. 
On uh, September 12th, Dad wrote in his diary that, uh, quote, convoy now north of Arctic Circle in the Arctic Ocean. They started to pass uh, half-submerged wreckage of lifeboats and life rafts with oars and life vests and other other material floating on the water, and they, they shuddered as they thought of the fate of the, the crew that had had been in those uh, rescue vessels. Sunday, September 13th, Dad writes in his diary, this is the start of the biggest convoy battle of World War II, according to the uh, British Admiralty, which he, he added that later. Dad, as uh, third mate, was in charge of uh, uh, providing ammunition for the stern gun station. Now, the stern gun station consisted of a four-inch deck gun and uh, several 50 caliber uh, Browning, uh, Browning uh, machine guns. This is the day, September 13th, when the convoy came within range of the uh, of the Luftwaffe bases in Northern Europe. And this is when uh, all hell started to break loose. Uh, Dad describes the first uh, wave of uh, attacking aircraft as, quote, like a swarm of giant black locusts was coming to attack us. Planes came in at, at masthead height. They combed the, the columns, dropping their aerial torpedoes uh, and machine gunning uh, every vessel that came within range. Dad said there were too many to count, but they could see the faces of the crew. He said every vessel and escort and merchant ship opened up with every weapon, three and a half and four inch deck guns, bofors, pom-poms, 20 millimeter aerocons, and their machine guns. Dad wrote, this was Armageddon, the decisive battle of good versus evil prophesied in the book of Revelation. He also wrote that he had very little hope that he would survive that day. Uh, it just seemed inevitable, ships exploding all around him, planes being blown out of the air. He, he, he said there's no grounds for any, any belief that he would survive. Now, the night before, uh, Lieutenant Roy Billings, the commander of the Naval Armed Guard on board the Green, had reassured Dad that they had 20,000 rounds of machine gun uh, ammunition loaded in their clips and that they had plenty of ammo not to worry but uh, halfway through the day, they ran out. So Dad, Dad went with three crew members down to the magazine, three decks below the main deck, to clip rounds into two machine gun belts. Probably the central event and for my father and for many of the men in the convoy was the explosion of the SS Mary Luckenbach. I'm going to read an excerpt from, from the book. I was in the port machine gun nest with Blackie. He manned the gun as I directed the gun laying. I would find a target for Blackie. He would fire on it. I would find the next target. There are many to choose from. We had to move fast. There was no time for indecision. The Heinekels were spraying with us with machine gun fire. The, the green was zigzagging now as bombs were dropping around us. Captain Vickers sighted two torpedoes coming at us off our port bow. Our left wheel, he ordered. The quartermaster responded instantly, and the ship's bow swung sharply to port to dodge the torpedoes. As the ship swung into the turn, her stern turned toward the Luckenbach, which was falling back from a beam of us to our starboard quarter. I was looking at the Luckenbach directly astern of us when a sudden giant ball of fire erupted from her. As the shock wave of the explosion hit me, I yelled, duck, at the top of my lungs, and we both fell to the deck of the gun nest. The force of the Mary Luckenbach explosion was terrifying. Our vessel was lifted from the sea and shook violently as the obliterated ammunition ship rained down on us in the form of shrapnel. We were enshrouded in a dense cloud of black smoke. Air, the air was saturated with dust and fouled by the acrid smell of gunpowder. We didn't know whether the green was going to remain afloat or plunge to the bottom of the barren sea. We climbed over the gun nest wall onto the poop deck and dove on, over the rail to the main deck below and crawled under cover. 10,000 tons of ship and cargo had been pulverized and blown sky high in an instant and were now falling from the heavens covering our ship and the sea around it with what had once been the SS Mary Luckenbach. Tons and tons of shrapnel continued to fall about us in every size and in cruel and grotesque shapes and patterns. The smoke around our gun nest gradually cleared, but the bridge and midship housing were still invisible. The after deck rigging was in ribbons. The crates and ca casing the fighter planes, which had been chained to the cargo hatches, had disintegrated and the tanks destined for Stalingrad were adrift of their anchor chains. Everything within sight was battered by the concussion and vacuum created by the explosion. Our clothing was ripped and torn by the blast and saturated with shrapnel. The forward part of the ship must have been blown to bits. I looked over the ship's side and saw the propeller slowly turning, 
Not knowing whether we were going to sink or remain afloat, I didn't know what we should do. Dive overboard and swim clear of the sinking, sinking ship suction, or hang on and wait for the for rescue by a destroyer. The latter seemed unlikely, considering how quickly the enemy pounced on and destroyed crippled merchant ships during yesterday's combat action. As I pondered our fate, the dense black smoke started to, to dissipate, and the rain of shrapnel subsided. Looking forward, I could make out the outline of the bridge. Then I heard the ship's whistle signaling us to report to boat stations. Looking aft from my gun station, I was stunned to see the mate lying prone on the afterdeck, sobbing hysterically and trying to claw through the steel plating to escape the shells, bullets, and falling shrapnel. Captain Vickers looked down at the man from the bridge and shouted at him to get up and return to his post. When the mate failed to respond to his command, Vickers ran into the warehouse and emerged with a Colt 45 pistol. He ran down the ladder, rushed over to the prostate figure, pushed the barrel into the back of the mate's head, and cocked the trigger. Seeing what Captain Vickers was about to do, I ran over, pushed his arm away, and gave the historical man a mighty kick in the ass. That did the trick. The mate rose to his feet, rubbed the backs of his hands over his cheeks, and walked quickly away without looking back. I returned to my gun station and Captain Vickers to the bridge. Thinking the Green herself had been torpedoed, he ordered an abandoned ship, and the crew manned the lifeboats. Before leaving the gun station for the lifeboats, I remember one last thing I had to do. When I was on watch the night before, Captain Vickers said to me, Mr. Gill, during today's battles, I noticed that none of our American ships or those of our allies flew their ensign. Now, if we had our stars and stripes flying from the gaff, I replied, aye, aye, sir, and promised that when we went into battle again, I would make sure the stars and stripes were flying. In the chaos of today's battle, I completely overlooked my commitment to the captain. Now that the abandoned ship alarm had been sounded and the crew was manning the lifeboats, I remembered my orders and made my way to the mainmast. I removed the ensign from its locker, bent it on its halyard, and aloft she went. When the men saw the stars and stripes flying from the gaff of the mainmast, they broke out in cheers. I felt a lump in my throat and was overwhelmed with emotion. I thought, what heroes, we have so much to fight for. Captain Vickers gave orders to the chief engineer to stop the ship's engines and make a quick survey of the mechanical equipment and the integrity of the watertight compartments. I mustered the men assigned to my lifeboat, made sure they were all there, and waited further orders from the captain. Captain Vickers sent the ship's whistle for dismissal from boat stations, and then he rang up full speed ahead on the engine room telegraph. We were going to attempt to catch up to the convoy. Those who were capable of standing watch were ordered back to their gun stations. The air was heavy with suspense. Would the Green make it back to her position in the convoy, or would the enemy aircraft circle back to administer the coup de grace, as we had seen them do repeatedly in yesterday's fighting? The men on the other ships in the convoy cheered and cheered as we caught up with them, the stars and stripes were still flying over this Yankee, so horribly scarred from battle with the enemy, with rigging hanging from the mast and threads, portholes blown in, heavy exterior oak doors blown off, life rafts blown away, and its deck strewn with debris from its shattered deck cargo and the shattered remains of the Mary Luckenbach. All that mattered to us now that we were still alive and afloat and that we were going to make it. On September 15th, Dad reported for duty on the bridge and decoded a message from the Commodore. The message read, reverence at your gun lane, you are at the top of the class. Turns out that Nathaniel Green shot down eight Nazi aircraft tied up at the dock at Maltovsk uh, on the Divina River on September 21st. Spent the next uh, two months discharging the cargo, taking on pulpwood uh, cargo for the return voyage uh, and effecting temporary repairs. Uh, one of the serious problems was the uh, compasses had been badly damaged in the explosion of the Luckenbach, and uh, they never really were uh, returned to true working condition uh, until they returned to uh, England or Scotland. On November 17th, the Green returned home, uh, supposedly in convoy uh, to the United Kingdom, but uh, the, the weather was uh, quite uh, quite severe, horrible gales, and the, the convoy lasted no more than a few hours. The ships dispersed to various points of the compass, and the Green actually was lost near the uh, north, near the ice pack and was in great uh, danger of uh, either running into Bear Island or into the ice and be becoming entombed for the winter. Uh, but somehow they found their way out and uh, 
returned to Iceland where they uh, took on uh, supplies for a day or two and then back to uh, Scotland. On January 21st, 1943, the Nathaniel Green sailed in convoy to the Mediterranean. The Green was uh, ordered to uh, Mastagam, Mastagam, Algeria, where she was to uh, discharge uh, war material to be used uh, in, to support the uh, North African landings of the American Army. On September 24th, 1943, the Green departed uh, Mastaganem. 15 minutes later, she was attacked, torpedoed. I'll, I'll read an excerpt from the book describing what it's like to be uh, torpedoed. Uh, Mastaganem was dropping below the horizon astern of us, and I went to my cabin to nap on the settee for a couple of hours before I reported for duty on the four to eight watch. My thoughts were of returning home to Mary as I drifted off into a sound sleep. Suddenly, I was awakened by a thunderous explosion. I was lifted bodily off the settee and slammed into the cabin ceiling and dropped back down onto the settee with a thud. In a state of shock, I sensed that the explosion had come from forward of my cabin. Before I could get my wits about me, there was another explosion. This one even more massive and even more deafening than the first. The second blast came from the engine room, which was immediately beneath my cabin. The force of the explosion blew me up against the ceiling and dropped me onto the steel deck where I struck my head and blacked out. I have no idea how long I lay unconscious on the deck, but I was awakened by live steam flowing into my cabin from the engine room. <clears throat> the steam smelled of cordite and was saturated with fine dust, <clears throat> which blinded me. <clears throat> As I looked about me in a daze, I realized what had happened. We had been torpedoed. I crawled across the deck, which was knee-deep in debris from the explosion and my scattered belongings. I felt my way to the doorway and discovered that the door was gone. I As I struggled through the debris strewn across the floor of my cabin, searching for essential belongings, I saw that the cabin was tilted and realized that the ship was going down the, by the head, sinking bow first. I grabbed my indispensable belongings, my sextant, my seaman's credentials, and Mary's letters. That was it. It was time to abandon ship. Crawling to my feet in the alleyway outside of my cabin, I could not see or hear anyone, and I cursed at the top of my lungs to attract attention. There was no one there to hear me. There was only one way to go, aft toward the stern, where I hoped the rest of the crew had gone. I scrambled up the sloping deck of the alleyway to the watertight doorway and swept the blackout curtains aside so I could climb out onto the boat deck. I looked aft and saw, to my great relief, that I was not alone on the ship. The merchant crew and armed guard were gathering on the stern deck. I joined the stragglers who were abandoning their amidships quarters, haggard and still in a state of shock from the explosions. The survivors warmly embraced each other and shook hands, grateful to still be alive. Dad then learned what had happened. The ship had, had been torpedoed uh, actually three times, uh, one from further stern, one uh, <clears throat> amidships, and one uh, at the bow. Dad spent uh, a few weeks uh, in, in Mastaganem with the captain and the chief engineer uh, salvaging a uh, uh, gun and other, other uh, material from the green and then returned home. He spent uh, a year or so teaching at uh, Fort Trumbull Merchant Marine Academy, and then uh, anxious to, to leave the home front, which he, he found embarrassing. He said uh, there were so many people, men his age, who had uh, draft-exempt jobs, who were making a lot of money, uh, who were enjoying a very favorable male-to-female ratio, and he constantly found himself trying to having to explain to people why he wasn't uh, in the service. So he joined the Navy, and because of uh, severe deafness caused by the uh, action uh, on the voyage to, to Russia and the torpedoing, he was felt no longer qualified for sea duty, but he was assigned to uh, a stevedore battalion at Pearl Harbor. Dad went out there. Uh, Mom joined him after a few months. So they spent the rest of the war in Pearl Harbor. In 1946, Dad was uh, discharged from the Navy. They returned to Boston, where Dad... Uh, uh, went to uh, college uh, at, uh, during the day, uh, worked at night to support his family, and then uh, enrolled in Harvard Business School, and received an MBA in 1951. At this point, I'd like to uh, welcome any questions that uh, members of the audience may have.